All right, welcome to our third and final video for chapter six. In this video, we're going to talk more about enzymes. So how do enzymes lower the activation energy for an endergonic or extragonic reaction? They help the substrate reach the transition state in one of several ways. So either it can position two or more substrates so they align perfectly for the reaction to happen, they can provide an optimal environment for the reaction to happen. Remember, there are specific amino acids in the active site, and these might, for example, be acidic or water-loving or polar, so that the substrates will be more likely to bind and align together for the reaction to happen. Sometimes people say enzymes are kind of like matchmakers for couples. They speed up the likelihood or the chance that the couples will get together. Uh, the enzyme might even contort or stress the substrate so it's less stable and more likely to react, or it temporarily reacts with the substrate directly. The active site binds or reacts with the substrate. It might chemically change it or temporarily change it so that it's more likely to react. But remember, I, I keep saying this because it's very important, at the end of the reaction, the enzyme becomes available again to catalyze the next reaction. So the enzyme is unchanged at the end of the reaction. Remember, since most enzymes are proteins, that three-dimensional shape is dependent upon the amino acid sequence, that primary structure of the polypeptide. So the amino acids, AA stands for amino acids, these amino acids, in the active site are really important in order for the substrate to bind to the active site. And I mentioned earlier that temperature is important because if you lower or raise the temperature too much, the three-dimensional shape of the protein might change, especially if it gets too warm, the protein might denature or lose its three-dimensional shape. And if you have a different pH, then what can happen is different pH values can actually change the, let me find one over here. I don't have any good ones. It can change the state of the active site. It might get rid of the negative charge or add a positive charge to the active site, which can minimize that bonding strength between the substrate and enzyme. I won't click on the video here because it takes about five minutes or so, but in our PDF slides on Canvas, if you go to the slides and you cut and paste the link here into your browser, it has a nice short video about how enzymes work and you can see the three-dimensional shape of the active site and how it reacts with the substrate. So how do we regulate enzymes if their purpose is to speed up reactions? Because maybe I don't want the reaction to be happening at some moment in time, for example. So here, our book gives us an example of the digestive cells and really the enzymes in our stomach work harder after a meal than when we sleep. How do we make sure we're not actively digesting if there's no food to digest. Luckily, we can regulate our enzymes through many ways. One example is through changing the temperature or pH of the environment. And the stomach, I know the stomach is very acidic, pH of two or less than two. Luckily, the digestive enzymes in the stomach work at that optimal pH. So if I had something like an ulcer, and those digestive enzymes leaked out of the stomach and into my blood. My blood has a pH of about 7.4. Those pH 2 enzymes that work really well in my stomach luckily will not work in my blood, so I don't have to worry about those enzymes chopping up the proteins I need to survive. And I can also make molecules that promote or inhibit the enzyme function, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Many enzymes also need coenzymes or cofactors in order to function properly. Luckily, enzymes are also compartmentalized. They're localized or located in specific places based on their function. For example, those digestive enzymes in my stomach or the digestive enzymes in my lysosomes. They're nicely packaged so they can only work in that region, in that location. Another way we can regulate enzymes is through inhibition. And there are two types of inhibitors we can use, competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are what they sound like. They compete with the substrate for the active site. 
So if I look at my picture on the right, here's the substrate, and it normally binds here at the active site. But if I have a competitive inhibitor that looks very similar to the substrate and can bind to the same site, I can prevent the substrate from binding and the reaction from happening. It's a lot like playing musical chairs where there is one chair, but maybe two people competing for that same chair. Only one person gets to sit in that chair. The other type of inhibitor we have are non-competitive inhibitors. These will not look like the substrate. Here's my non-competitive inhibitor. You can see it does not look like the substrate, so it doesn't bind to the active site. It binds at a different site, usually called the allosteric site. And what it does is it prevents the reaction from happening either by changing the shape of the active site so the substrate can no longer bind, or in this case, I can see the substrate can still bind, but it changes the shape of the enzyme. In this case, the enzyme can no longer close for both sites to bind because this is taking up space right here. It changes the shape ultimately of the enzyme so it no longer can go through the usual reaction, resulting in no reaction happening. So how do inhibitors change reaction rates? If I look at this graph, on the y-axis I have the rate of the reaction, on the x-axis I have the substrate concentration. Without inhibitors, I can see the normal rate of the reaction, catalyzed by the enzyme, increases and gets saturated over time when all the enzymes are used up. There's a maximum reaction rate, and that we learned about before is saturation, so all of the enzymes are in use at the moment. If I have a competitive, competitive inhibitor, it looks like I can also eventually reach that saturation point, my highest reaction rate, but it takes more time. And the reason for that is because the competitive inhibitor is binding to some of those active sites. And I can overcome this by increasing the substrate concentration. This is actually what happens when we have individuals with carbon monoxide poisoning that we can still save. It turns out that in our red blood cells, we have these proteins called hemoglobin proteins that bind to oxygen. But carbon monoxide can bind to the same site that oxygen usually binds to. So what happens is to get rid of carbon monoxide poisoning, you can put a person into a room under high pressure, 100% oxygen, to overcome, to outcompete that competitive inhibitor. In the last example over here, non-competitive inhibition, I can see that I never reach that saturation point because even if I increase the substrate concentration, the non-competitive inhibitor is not binding to the active site. It's binding to the allosteric site and changing the shape of the enzyme so it no longer functions properly. So you cannot outcompete a non-competitive inhibitor. So I mentioned non-competitive inhibitors bind to a different site called the allosteric site to cause allosteric inhibition. So these are also known as allosteric inhibitors. And I have an example shown up here. The red one is an example of an allosteric inhibitor because it's not binding to the active site. That's the active site. Instead, it's binding to a different site called the allosteric site. And in the case of this four subunit enzyme, it looks like the allosteric inhibitor stabilizes the inactive form where the active site is closed so the substrate cannot bind and the reaction does not happen. But we also have allosteric activators. These are proteins or molecules that will bind to the allosteric site as well, but they optimize the active site so the substrate can bind. So allosteric activators will promote the reaction and allow the infinity, the likelihood for the substrate to bind to the active site to increase, whereas allosteric inhibitors will change or close the active site. So you reduce or even prevent the binding of the substrate to the active site. If we think of some of our pharmaceutical drugs and how they're developed, many of them work by inhibiting enzymes along metabolic pathways. So one example are a group of drugs called statins. statins. 
Statins, their purpose is really to lower cholesterol levels in the blood. And one enzyme that's really important here is HMG-CoA reductase. This is an enzyme that produces cholesterol from lipids. So if we can inhibit this enzyme, we can actually reduce the amount of cholesterol produced and lower the cholesterol levels in the blood. And in this case, this is actually a type of competitive inhibition. So statins work by blocking the active site of HMG-CoA reductase. So you don't have to memorize this for the test or anything, but here's an example of that enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, that produces cholesterol from our lipids. And here's Another way to regulate enzyme function is through the presence or availability of cofactors and coenzymes. Remember I mentioned earlier that most enzymes will require some kind of cofactor or coenzyme to, to function properly. And the difference between cofactors and coenzymes are whether they're organic or not. Cofactors are usually inorganic ions, like these different uh, metals here. One example we'll see later is DNA polymerase, an enzyme that produces DNA requires zinc as a cofactor in order to work properly. Coenzymes are similar, but these are organic molecules, usually some kind of metal bonded to a carbon-containing organic molecule. And these include uh, ATP, NADH, and different vitamins we get from our diet. So here are some examples of vitamins that function as coenzymes to allow our enzymes to work properly. Maybe in other classes or in books you've read in the past, um, you've heard of scurvy, which people used to get when they were on ships traveling across the ocean for long periods of time. So they would have to bring things like limes or oranges to make sure they prevent scurvy. And this is because many of the enzymes that build our connective tissue collagen, so under the skin, um, require vitamin C as a coenzyme to function properly. So when people didn't get enough vitamin C from foods and fruits like uh, these oranges or lemons or limes, then they would not have enough of the cofactor for the enzyme to function. So they wouldn't have enough collagen and you would see these symptoms. You would see lesions on the skin. That was probably the most common because it's most visible and other uh, Symptoms like irritability, joint pain, scaly skin, etc. And in addition to competitive and non competitive inhibition, we also have a very important type of inhibition called feedback inhibition. And if I think about my metabolic pathways that are happening inside of the cell, there is no like power or on and off switch inside of our cells. So, how do our cells know when to start making? some kind of molecule and when to stop making it when we have too much of it. Luckily, there is some kind of self-feedback we call feedback inhibition in our metabolic reactions. And this is a really important way that cells self-regulate how much of a molecule they're making. So let's see how this works. Here is my enzyme, and it looks like there's an active site that the substrate usually binds. In this case, it's an amino acid called threonine. Threonine binds to the active site, produces some kind of intermediate, sends it to the next enzyme, etc. It produces a bunch of intermediates. Eventually, you get your product that you want from this metabolic pathway called isoleucine. So what happens when I have way too much isoleucine and I'm like, okay, stop making this because I'm burning a bunch of energy powering these reactions and I already have way too much isoleucine? Luckily, we have feedback inhibition, where the end product of the reaction of this long metabolic pathway can act as an allosteric inhibitor. It binds to the allosteric site, which results in a closure, remember that change in the active site. So now that it's closed, the substrate, threonine, can no longer bind to this active site. And over time, you'll see that these reactions stop you no longer make isoleucine and the levels of isoleucine will drop down to normal. So this is really neat because how it self-regulates is once you have 
not enough or you run out of isoleucine, it'll fall off. You won't have enough to bind to the allosteric site. The active site will open up again and you can make more of these intermediates and more isoleucine in the reaction again. So feedback inhibition usually involves an inhibitor that's an allosteric inhibitor, which also happens to be one of the end products, or if, if not the end product, the final end product of the pathway. So we're gonna see that this is a really nice method for cells to self-regulate the production rate of some kind of product, where too much of the product acts as an allosteric inhibitor. And we'll see in chapter seven that ATP itself can be an allosteric inhibitor for some of the enzymes involved in a process known as cellular respiration, the focus of our next chapter. All right, that takes us to the end of chapter six. In the next chapter, chapter seven, we're going to be talking about the topic of cellular respiration, how we break down